So a few weeks ago, I was walking around on campus when Clan Add the Motion picture popped into my head. Instantly infuriated, I began swearing out loud because who wouldn't? It's Clan Add the Motion picture. But unfortunately, as I was doing this, the dean happened to be walking by. I was stopped and asked why I just referred to him as a dumb fucking sh I tried to explain that I wasn't referring to him, but he wasn't having it. I was then expelled from the university, and now I live on the street. Thankfully, I still have my computer and microphone, so I was able to make this video for you all. So no, the title is not clickbait, this movie literally ruined my life. Now, some of you might be wondering if this story is truthful. Clan Add the Motion Picture is an adaptation of one of my all-time favorite stories. Directed by legendary director Osamu Dezaki and animated by the ever-so-popular Toei Animation, Dezaki in particular seemed like a safe bet as he was known for revolutionizing the way anime was made in the 60s and 70s, pioneering dozens of techniques that would go on to be used for decades. And with all the original voice actors reprising their roles, I would imagine that if I was a Clan Add fan back in 2007, I'd be pretty excited, but I wasn't, and I think that's for the better too, because I think this film is garbage. The fact that it has a 7.24 on my anime list and a 7.5 on IMDb keeps me up at night, so I'm going to take this opportunity to put it in its place. Please keep in mind that I'm going to be spoiling Clan Ad in this video, every version of it, and in order to explain how this version fails as both an adaptation and a standalone film, we need to talk about the characters. Our main main character, Tomoya Okazaki, is somehow both horribly unlikable and completely forgettable. He meanders around being rude to everyone while brooding about his relatable problems and dark past. Lovely. Other than that, there isn't a single character trait you can glean from this guy. He's so passive and uninteresting that Sunohara is more of a protagonist than he is. I'm sorry if you just threw up a little in your mouth while hearing that, but it's true. When Nagasa's posters get taken down by school officials, Sunohara is the one who takes initiative and leaps into action. When he tries to dip out of going to Nagasa's house for dinner, it's revealed that he has a part-time job outside of school that he's working in order to help his family through tough times. Times. After Nagisa's death, Sunohara goes over to Tomoya's house to try to cheer him up a little, and he has this genuinely touching moment outside when he fails to make an impact. You can really tell this guy cares. In comparison, Tomoya cares about nothing until the plot demands it, and he takes zero initiative to interact with others or become a better person. Everything good that happens to him just falls into his lap, because that's what the original story was about, right? His job, his friends, his father, Nagisa, these are all things that he has to earn in the visual novel by putting himself out there and growing into a mature adult over the course of several years. All of that uplifting, beautiful storytelling gets completely thrown to the wayside because I guess we had to fit in all these dumb cameos that don't do anything for the story. Tomoyo is a piece of cardboard who doesn't do anything important. And Kyo is even worse, being reduced to little more than her yes man. Kotomi shows up like twice and she doesn't have a single line, but hey guys, look, it's to me. Akio has been viciously neutered, which is a real shame. All of his wit and humor has been reduced to just being taller than other people and hitting them. Did I mention this movie isn't funny? Coco knows Judo now for some reason, and that's all I know about her. Tomoya's father is only used to pay for his son's train ticket at the end of the film, and Yusuke's only purpose is to drag him out of bed and onto the train because god forbid he choose to do anything by himself. Nagisa is nothing like herself, and unfortunately Unfortunately, that isn't for the better. She's much more assertive, stripping away one of her defining characteristics and failing to replace it with anything else, making her exceptionally boring. This also means that she constantly pesters this pathetic asshole until he magically decides that he loves her. In the original, we had a rude yet caring delinquent meet a feeble girl who lacks self-confidence. The delinquent feels trapped in place by time, constantly struggling against his static and unchanging reality. The girl feels the opposite opposite, wishing that time would slow down so all the happy things in her life never need to fade away. By slowly growing closer to each other through 
a mutual effort between two people who no longer believe that they deserve happiness, they're both able to find what they were looking for together. Can you tell that a couple of things got lost in translation here? And speaking of things that got lost, my desire to have eyeballs anymore. I absolutely despise the way this film was directed. Now, to be fair, I am very unfamiliar with Dezaki's work. I'm sure that many of the techniques he pioneered were used to great effect in his more well-known projects. But here, they're tacky, cheap, and they pulled me out of the movie every time I saw one. Back in the 70s, I'm guessing budgets were a lot more tight than they were in 2007, and studios needed to get their money's worth out of every frame they drew. So, you know, maybe you could split the frame in half so you only have to draw half of one for a couple of seconds. Maybe you could create a really nice looking frame that you can hold on, creating a time saver masquerading as an aesthetic choice. Why not repeat the same animation three times at different speeds? Sure, it looks horrible, but I think I'd prefer that to having a static image for a few seconds. And uh-oh, looks like our art direction is terrible. Maybe we can make up for it by just shoving random bullshit in every frame so people think they're watching a real movie. Here's a fun game you can play. Take a look at any background in this film and ask yourself why anything is the way it is. Why are there god rays coming through these thunderclouds? Why are Nagisa and Coco charging their key here? Why are there cherry blossoms literally everywhere, even in places where there aren't any trees? Why does this shot exist? Why are there so many stupid Dutch angles? Why is this room so huge? Why does a flock of doves fly by every seven seconds with the exact same godforsaken sound effect? Why does this scene with Nagisa on the bridge hurt my eyes so much? Why is every single frame being perpetually flashbanged? It got to the point where once Nagisa was lying on her deathbed, my brother felt the need to say this. I'd say don't go into the light, but every fucking direction in this town leads to the light. <laughs> Maybe some of you out there think that this looks good, and that's fine, but I'd much prefer KyoAni's more realistic depiction, which was teeming with life and amazing little details. This movie just looks like a fever dream. I'd be able to get behind it if any amount of effort was put into this off-the-wall aesthetic, but every technique just screams to me that Toei was either strapped for cash or time. And coming from a studio as well-known and successful as they are, I can't really think of an excuse for this. Now, I know what you're thinking. Anime is important, but the quality of the story is what truly makes or breaks most movies. Well, I kind of already verbally assaulted the story while talking about the characters, but I'll elaborate a little more. This film's pacing is extremely quick and very sloppy. It's in this weird state of indecision where it wants to insert as many story beats from the source material as possible while also changing stuff around for the sake of its own story. This leads to half the scenes in the movie being completely pointless. Why should I care about Tomoy his history with his father when their issues never get resolved? Why should I care about Tomoya and Nagisa's relationship when he only falls in love with her because they both dreamed about the illusionary world? I bet you could put a jar of spaghetti sauce in its mother's wedding dress and tell Tomoya it had the same dream as he did and he'd fall in love with it. Well, maybe that's not being completely honest. I mean, spaghetti sauce jars don't have moms. Why should I care about Tomoya's acceptance of his role as a father when it doesn't make any sense and we don't even learn who is daughter is as a person? Why should I care about Nagisa's relationship with her parents when she doesn't seem to care about the way her birth drastically altered their lives? Why should I care about Nagisa's death when they tell me it's going to happen less than five minutes in before I've even properly met the girl? Look, I think change is a good thing for adaptations like this because telling Clanad's unabridged story in 90 minutes is a fool's errand. But if you're going to do it, make sure you actually go all the way. The only change you made with most of these elements was just removing the substance. The events are here, but the buildup and character growth that made these moments so special are gone. I would have liked to see more stuff like what you did with Sunahara. I like how he's this feral beast half the time and the most well put together human being in the movie the next. If this film had good writing, I bet there'd be a lot of great jokes and clever bits of characterization you could do. Hell, I'll give you another one. This movie's version of Dongo Daikazuku is actually actually pretty good. This heretic and those who follow him 
must be silenced. This slander offends all who walk the path. Now oh, come on, I know it's not much compared to the original, but it's cute, it's fun, it even gives the film some semblance of its own identity. And you know what? As much as I'd love to give this movie its first and only compliment, I can't. Because they had the gall to replace the visual novel's version of this song, and then still use the palm of a tiny hand for the credits theme. If you're watching this video while laying down, please make sure that your head is turned to the side so you don't choke on your own vomit. I'm sorry for doing this to you twice in a row. That that looks like a pain to clean up. Anyways, for those who are unfamiliar or just need a refresher, in the original, this song plays at the end of a journey that lasted dozens of hours. You hear it as this incomplete instrumental piece countless times, as it's Nagisa's character theme. The anime takes things a step further by giving us multiple thematically appropriate renditions of it. It stays by your side wherever you go, and it's one of the first things you hear upon starting up a new save file. So when I got to the end and found this on omnipresent song had lyrics the entire time, beautifully putting into words the reason for living that the characters had found for themselves after years of hardship, it fucking broke me. It is one of the most beautiful moments in storytelling I have ever experienced. So let me ask you this, what is the purpose of taking that song, which was tailor-made to end off a journey with its main leitmotif, and placing it at the end of this film where that motif is completely absent and we've only known these characters Characters for a little over an hour. That is the biggest slap in the face this movie could have possibly given to the original story, and it's a perfect example of how vapid and soulless this film is. It's an adaptation that removed the purpose from the original and replaced it with nothing. All you can gain from it is whatever entertainment value you can manage to find. And with awful animation, worse characters, and a messy plot that never earns anything, good luck with that. All that leaves you with is this non-existent and fourth pillar that made the original so special. I'm not trying to suggest that every story needs a strong message, but Clanad does. That's what it was made to do. If you can't understand that, and you want to pretend that you're the same thing just because you have similar story beats, then you have no business adapting it. This is not the kind of story where you ask, can I turn this into a movie? If you want the right to tell Clanad's story, earn it care about it. Realize that it deserves the time, attention, and respect that Toei failed to give it here. And guess what? There's already a studio that did that. If there's one positive thing to be taken away from this movie, it's that it was swiftly swept under the rug less than a month after it came out by people who actually cared. I'm glad that they were able to do it justice. Don't watch this movie if you haven't. And please keep the people who only know about Clanad because of it in your thoughts and prayers.